In this video, I'd like to introduce the topic of landscape archaeology. There's a wide variety of approaches to landscape archaeology, and I'm only going to be able to touch on each of those today. In future, I'd like to produce some further videos that will delve into each of these topics in more detail. The term landscape originates in art history, where it came to refer to artists' views of forests, valleys, and rural scenes. Originally, many of these scenes also had people in them, either at leisure, dwarfed by massive trees, or going about their daily jobs, plowing fields, tending sheep, or harvesting grain. Geographers, anthropologists, and archaeologists who have adopted the term landscape have characterized it in different ways. Daniels and Cosgrove provide a more traditional definition of landscape simply as a pictorial way of representing or symbolizing surroundings. By contrast, in very influential work by Tim Ingold, landscape is not a picture in the imagination surveyed by the mind's eye, nor is it an alien and formless substrate awaiting the imposition of human order. Through living in it, the landscape becomes part of us, just as we are part of it. In a landscape, each component unfolds within its essence the totality of its relations with each and every other. Just as many early landscape paintings incorporated romantic views of archaeological ruins, archaeology today incorporates many aspects of landscape. As archaeologists adopted the landscape approach through the lens of geography, for a long time landscape archaeology involved conceptualizing landscape as kind of a canvas on which people of the past placed things like villages, cemeteries, and hunting grounds. Today, most landscape archaeologists take a more dynamic approach. Instead of seeing landscape as just a passive backdrop or a set of environmental circumstances that people have to adapt to, they see landscape as a complex and dynamic thing made up of myriad relationships among humans, animals, plants, and inorganic materials. However, this doesn't mean they've abandoned all of the methods that were developed in earlier stages of landscape archaeology. Broadly speaking, landscape archaeology includes all those aspects of archaeology that take place at a regional scale, rather than at the site level. So it includes things like analyses of settlement patterns, agricultural land use, hunting and gathering territories, and landscape infrastructure, such as roads, dams, canals. And it also includes ideological, sacred, or conceptual aspects of landscapes. Landscape archaeology also involves distinct kinds of archaeological field methods. Some of these we borrow from geology and geomorphology to get a picture of the physical aspects of the past environment. A really important one is archaeological survey that typically involves field walking but can also involve more intrusive methods or even geophysical survey such as ground penetrating radar or space-based lidar and speaking of space, aerial photography has had a long relationship to landscape archaeology, increasingly supplemented by satellite imagery. And recently, drone survey has become a very important component of landscape archaeology. Archaeologists typically integrate these with a GIS, or Geographic Information System, another tool we've borrowed from geography. Of course, early archaeologists may do without any such tools. And in Europe, what came to be known as field archaeology mostly involved walking around and mapping various kinds of monuments, burial cairns, tumuli, and so on, many of which were pretty highly visible. One of the major products of this kind of work were a series of maps that showed the spatial distribution of such monuments and allowed archaeologists to begin to make some inferences about patterns in those distributions no longer focusing only on monuments. By the 1920s, in Europe and elsewhere, archaeologists had developed a range of methods for the close inspection of fields for traces of ancient land use. For example, they were able to identify and classify ancient field systems on the basis of things like lynchets, which are mounded ridges on the downslope of ancient fields that result from centuries of plowing. This type of work didn't occur only in Europe, 
as archaeologists, many of them amateurs, were also doing similar kinds of work in places like the United States. Arguably, the most fundamental research tool in landscape archaeology is archaeological survey. And the most common form of archaeological survey is field walking, sometimes called pedestrian survey, which involves systematically walking across the ground and scanning the surface for artifacts and features such as wall lines that might be visible. Typically, archaeologists do this with team members walking parallel pathways or transects spaced a certain distance apart, such as 2 meters or 5 meters. Field walking can be highly effective where visibility is very good, such as plowed fields, deserts, and some pastures with very little vegetation. Where vegetation, overlying sediments, or other factors impede visibility, archaeologists have to use more intrusive methods, such as shovel testing or test pitting or coring or augering. In some of these surveys, archaeologists mark the locations of artifacts they find with pin flags and record the artifacts in the field, while other surveys involve collecting the artifacts for later description. Both of these scenarios require careful recording of the artifacts in the field so that we can later analyze their distribution. And today, some projects use tablets to record the locations of sites or transects, as well as other relevant information. In the early 20th century, archaeologists were quick to recognize the potential of aerial photography one of its more obvious applications was to produce spectacular views of Roman ruins in the Syrian deserts. One of the most important proponents of aerial archaeology was the English archaeologist O.G.S. Crawford, who was also editor of the journal Antiquity. Crawford and others realized that an aerial perspective would not only allow them to take spectacular views of major monuments like barrows and hill forts, but also allowed them to detect archaeological features that would be virtually impossible to recognize while walking on the ground. Photos taken at the right time of day would reveal shadows due to microtopographic differences, while ones taken at the right time of year often would show crop marks that result when variations in soil moisture affect the health of vegetation. Today, another tool at our disposal is satellite imagery. The imagery currently available has much lower resolution than aerial photographs do, but it can still be very useful for mapping, identifying certain kinds of sites, and especially for identifying locations where archaeological materials are likely to occur. Geoarchaeology is critical to landscape archaeology because it's usually unreasonable to expect the ancient landscape to look anything like the modern one. Geoarchaeologists examine gullies and eroded scarps to reconstruct the depositional history of valley bottoms and are sometimes able to date these exposures by the presence of artifacts found in them. They can also use coring and augering both to find the sequence of deposits as well as to recover things like pollen that can be used to reconstruct the climate and vegetation history of a region. Where it's necessary to reach really deep deposits, this requires the use of heavy equipment for coring or augering. While augering churns up the sediments as they're brought to the surface, coring produces a continuous cylinder of sediment. Understanding the geological history of a region can have really important implications for where you're likely to find certain kinds of archaeological sites. For example, if you're looking for caves in the karstic limestone of southern France, Israel, or southern China, you should expect Paleolithic cave sites to be located quite high up on the sides of the valleys. That's because erosion has cut deeply through the limestone over time, incising deep troughs or valleys. This little animation gives you an idea of how this can work in some cases. As a stream flows into some lower body of water, it sometimes deposits alluvium, but mostly it cuts into the underlying bedrock. 
so that after hundreds of thousands of years, it incises a fairly deep valley in the bedrock. As water tables fall, caves begin to form in the upper limestones, and colluvial sediments accumulate on flatter margins of the valley, called terraces. By the present, we're only going to find the oldest sites in the uppermost parts of the valley, while the lower parts of the valley will only contain relatively modern materials. Much of the landscape archaeology of the 1960s and 70s focused on the analysis of site distributions in terms of settlement patterns, often using methods and theories that they borrowed from geography. Archaeologists of that period often interpreted settlement patterns in terms of crystallarian hexagonal settlement lattices. Chris Tyler had noticed that on flat plains, cities, towns, and villages tended to be arranged in hexagonal patterns. And later, Lush further developed Chris Tyler's theories, showing how divergences from the assumption of a flat plain, such as river valleys and coastlines, altered the model by distorting the hexagonal lattice. Among the methods that archaeologists borrowed from geographers in that period were the use of Thiessen polygons, which are used to estimate the territories around a town or city, and nearest neighbor analysis, which allows us to determine whether or not the points on a map are clustered, evenly spaced out, or just randomly distributed. They can also be used to find the most efficient pathways between the points on the map. Arguably, geography's most lasting theoretical influence on archaeology stems from our use of a suite of methods that are found in geographic information systems. These lend themselves to perception of the landscape not as a single canvas, but as a set of canvases layered on top of one another. Although this influences, and to some extent limits, the way we think about landscapes, it also provides all kinds of tools for us to explore exactly those relationships among people and other things that occur in landscapes. For example, we can do calculations based on the data in several layers of the GIS and use that to create a completely new layer that shows a new kind of data. As I'll discuss in a later video, one very useful kind of layer we can produce is a layer that estimates the probability of finding particular kinds of archaeological sites in particular regions. Recently, archaeologists have also begun to adopt tools like social network analysis in order to explore the interconnectedness of landscapes. This has particularly obvious application to studies of such things as ancient road networks, but it's also much more widely applicable. Landscape archaeologists also differ in the extent to which they think of human activity as being parceled out into distinct spaces, usually called sites. In some contexts, sites seem to be a reasonable concept. For example, Near Eastern tells, sometimes bordered by large fortification walls, are pretty obviously sites. On the other hand, quite often archaeologists define sites solely on the basis of elevated artifact densities, sometimes even modeling them statistically, as with this bivariate normal distribution. But archaeologists also recognize that most of the things that people do are not neatly tied to particular spots on the landscape. As Susan Blair notes in this quotation, from the perspective of the people who lived in these ancient landscapes, salmon pools, collecting areas, and the pathways between them can be more important than campsites and villages. Some archaeologists, notably James Ebert, have explicitly eschewed the concept of site altogether. Ebert argues for a kind of distributional archaeology that's based on the distribution of individual artifacts across the landscape. It can involve looking at variations in the densities of artifacts over space, or variation in the ratio of one artifact type to another, or can involve other kinds of statistical analyses of the artifact distributions. I expect to talk more about this type of archaeology in a later video. Archaeologists have even found ways to apply the concept of fractals to landscape archaeology. As it turns out, settlement patterns have a fractal dimension as do canal systems and road systems. More humanistic kinds of landscape archaeology emphasize the idea that human activities are embedded in rather than just layered onto landscapes. In addition, some archaeologists have focused on the perception and even affect or emotional response in the experience of landscapes.
These take phenomenology as their theoretical perspective. Many landscape archaeologists, and not just phenomenologists, are interested in the ideological and symbolic aspects of landscapes. Sometimes this kind of research focuses on exactly the same kinds of sites that were of interest to the early field archaeologists, such as large monuments that have astronomical alignments, and barrows and cairns on hilltops. And sometimes they focus on things like caves and waterfalls and sacred mountains. As I mentioned at the beginning of this video, I was only able to touch on most of the topics that are relevant to landscape archaeology. I do plan to produce some more videos in future that will go into some of these topics in more detail, including archaeological survey, use of predictive modeling in archaeological surveys, as well as some of the more recent theoretical developments and approaches to landscape. Thank you, and stay safe. Mm -hmm.